I'm going to talk about MR safety, um, specifically targeted for level two personnel. Um, so some of the stuff we're going to go over is maintaining a safe environment, um, the personnel and their roles, magnetism and MRI, going over different hazards that are in MRI, uh, emergency preparedness, psychological distress, MR contrast, screen, and then some brief um, information on impact safety. So first thing for maintaining a safe environment, of course there's the zone model, so you have the four different zones. Um, zone one is gonna be your public access, it's freely accessible, pretty much everywhere other than your department is zone one, so this is by definition also zone one, which is kind of meaningless, but makes fun jokes because of that. Um, zone two is gonna be your transition zone. This is where you're screening, changing, um, your holding area for people should be located, specifically for outpatients. Even on your workflow, inpatient holding might be in zone three though. So zone three is gonna be restricted access. Um, the area is gonna be near the magnet room. Um, it could pose a hazard to not MR screen patients and personnel. And then zone four is the MR room itself. This is for MR screen persons only. Uh, not on MR personnel must be escorted by level two trained personnel. So, some things for following a safe environment, of course, following the Brazil recommendations as close as possible. This may not always be possible, though, depending on the construction of your site. So in this case, we have, this is at OSU, there's in the James there, there's actually, they put Buckeyes on the floor there as a delineation between their zone, kind of zone three, zone two area, because there wasn't really a physical barrier. Um, the restricted access is behind you in that area room there. Um, so, but for also maintaining a safe environment, depending on your area, there may be easy access to your main MR door. In that case, you definitely want to have a, some type of locking mechanism where the door is locked, but can be open from the inside. Um, I've been to places like this, and so the techs carry around a key for the door so they can get in, but no one else can open that door. And then it just gets closed behind them whenever they go in and out. So, also, leaving the doors open is a bad idea, even in your controlled environment. Um, and there could be people that, you know, there might be someone in that area that hasn't been fully screened or isn't really thinking and might try to run the room for any reason. So you always want to keep that door closed. Um, also, keep the area free from ferromagnetic risk. So don't have things that are, could be potentially brought into the room in the immediate vicinity of any of your doors. Um, also, all equipment prior to bringing it into MRI should be tested. Um, you want to put labels on equipment that's kept in the MR environment, so whether it's safe, conditional, or unsafe. Only MR personnel should be taking any equipment into or out of the room unless the other person has been directed specifically by the technologist. So unless you tell someone who isn't personnel to bring it in, they shouldn't be bringing anything in there. So just some examples of things. You might have uh, conditional monitors, conditional pumps, maybe a ventilator that's conditional in your environment. Um, of course, things you don't want, probably want to bring in, as most of you know, you have monitors that aren't the MR conditional monitor, any phones, hemostats, carts, O2 tanks, credit cards, pagers, phones, any of that stuff. So for personnel, there's you have non-MR personnel, level one, and then level two personnel. So of course, non-MR personnel, this would be your patients, visitors, um, maybe facility staff, um, it could be some of your nursing, depending on where they're from. Um, they don't have, basically, if they have not had formal safety training in the past year, they are considered non-MR personnel. Um, the role of these people in this environment, of course, is to follow the instructions of the MR personnel when they're in that environment. And this is things that you want to explain to them when they're coming in, make sure that they're aware of what their function is when they're in your environment, so everyone's on the same page. Um, they also are restricted from zones three or four unless there's level two supervision in the area. Level one personnel get minimal safety education related to MR. So this would probably be most of your nurse, a lot of the nurses, the MR nurses that are in the area. Um, if you have any BCAs in the area that you work with, they also might involve them. Um, potentially office staff. Um, if you have anesthesia that attend, is visits the area frequently, they also may receive level one training. Again, their role is basically they, to owe no, be responsible for their own safety. Um, they can move freely through zones three and four. So that's the MR room, 
and uh, just outside the MR room area. Um, they can kind of, you know, they also want to supervise the environment as best they can, make sure there's no one in the area that they don't recognize, um, keeping the door closed behind them, locked when it's not being supervised. And they can perform initial screening of patients. And they also need, are responsible for a yearly MR safety training. If you're level two personnel, uh, this is going to be comprehensive safety training. So this is going to be your technologists, radiologists. Uh, this may be your MR physicists. So the role for MR level two personnel, of course, is the road safety, supervision of the magnetic environment and other people in that environment. So that includes patients, subjects, families, staff. Um, again, keeping the door closed, observing, keeping monitoring the area. Um, they are also are responsible for the final screening of MR patients. So they can do, um, they should be the last person that checks the screening forms before the patient's brought into the room. Um, again, they need to have yearly comprehensive MR training. And also they need to be trained in proper use of MR equipment. So some of the basics of magnetism, um, all objects, of course, do possess some form of magnetism. They could either be paramagnetic, which a subclass of that is ferromagnetism, which is what we're primarily concerned with. And then there's also diamagnetic. Uh, ferromagnetic objects do pose the largest hazard. So anything that's made of iron, nickel, or cobalt, or any alloys containing any of those metals are the things that we possess ferromagnetism. So of course the MR magnet is a superconducting magnet. It's cryogenically cool. The magnet is not off at any time. It is always on. Um, unless you hit the quench button, then it might be off. Or occasionally random spontaneous quenches, but Always assume it's on unless you know otherwise. So we have some of the static field forces. There's, of course, uh, that one. Uh, MR hazards. I'm supposed to look at that slide. Um, we have the translational force, which is kind of missile projectile effect. We have rotational forces, which is your torque. You have lens forces. You have the MR gradients, acoustic noise, and you also have the radio frequency field for hazards there. So translational forces. Um, this is a strong attraction of magnetic materials. This is also known as the missile effect. Um, objects can accelerate upwards of 60 more kilometers per hour or you know, about 40, 50 miles an hour going into the scanner. Um, and the force that caused this is related to the spatial gradient field. And it's going to be strong. The strongest force pulling will be at the maximum spatial gradient of that magnet. So if we have pictures here, um, basically stronger spatial gradients is going to equal stronger pulling force. So just a map of spatial gradients here. So you can see in the center magnet, there is no spatial gradient at isocenter. So there isn't gonna be any force on the object, pulling wise. Um, but when you're outside, just outside the magnet, there's gonna be a strong force in this area. And the further away you get, again, that force does get weaker. Um, another map picture of this is showing a similar thing. Again, in the center, you have not, there's not gonna be any force here. And as you work your way out, you can see that the, the strength of the magnet here is strongest right up here. And that's where the force is going to be strongest on any object. So we also have rotational forces. Uh, magnetic objects are going to attempt to align with the magnetic field. This could cause is an issue because it can cause tearing, severing, or other traumatic injury to tissues if an object does attempt to twist or align with the field. So things like that. If you have an oblong object, they're going to be affected most. And if you have something that's spherical. There's going to be, if it is a perfect sphere, there's going to be no torque on the object, but you still would have the translational forces and things like that. Um, the torque force is actually greatest inside the magnet. So unlike the translational forces, which are going to be greatest just outside the magnet and go to zero inside the magnet, the torque force is going to be decrease, it's going to increase as you get to the uh, stronger magnetic fields. So and when you get to isocenter, it's going to be the strongest there. And this does scale with field strength. So if you're on a 1.5, it's going to be weaker than if it was on a 3T. So one of the considerations for that, of course, is aneurysm clips are a common one. Um, even though the clips are small, they might, if they're slightly ferromagnetic, they could twist to align with the field, which could actually sever the aneurysm at the very clip. So these are one reason you have to you want to screen for these materials really closely. So lens forces, these are ones that people aren't generally as familiar with. Basically, uh, it's conductive materials will resist motion in the magnetic field. 
So primarily it's anything that's magnet, um, anything metallic, particularly that isn't ferromagnetic, is gonna have experience these lens forces. Um, ferromagnetic objects do also experience these, but their ferromagnetism is that so much stronger, it's usually not really observed. Um, so things you might run into this, um, implants, uninformed bodies, um, the faster you move through the field, the stronger the force is going to be, and also the larger the object, the stronger the force. So, you know, if you have a patient that has a pain pump or something that is conditional, it may not be ferromagnetic, but they still, if you move them through the field quickly, they may feel a tugging or pulling on the device, and that's what they're experiencing is the lens forces. Um, anytime you do find a foreign object or anything in someone, for that reason, you also want to move them slowly through because they'll experience less force on the object. playing drums next door. Um, so you want to move slow and you're pretty much, it's the safest way to go. Um, one of the things you can play with if you have a very large pizza pan that's aluminum, if you hold it up and you try to move towards the scanner really quickly, it'll be like you're hitting a brick wall, depending on how you have it oriented. If you move slowly, it's easy to move through. Of course, if you bring something like that in, make sure it's not ferromagnetic before you go in the room with it. So the time varying magnetic field, so this is going to be from your gradients. Um, this is vibration of conductive materials. So again, implants, external objects, or foreign bodies. Uh, this is also the cause of peripheral nerve stimulation. So patients can have, um, generally it's usually limited to muscle contractions. So they may have, basically the scanner through the gradients can cause inadvertent muscle contractions. Um, I experience this actually in my forehead if I'm doing like chest or abdomen imaging. They're like a muscle spasm in my forehead when during certain sequences. It's not gonna hurt them, but it is kind of irritating. Um, it can also induce voltages in any conductive materials. So this is why, again, why we need to know what implants are before you put people in the scanner. Um, it can interfere with different active implants, so stimulators, pacemakers, um, ICDs, those types of devices can cause interference. Um, also, this is the source of the very loud noise the scanner makes. So as for stimulation, for the most part, this is where we're operating in MRI. So most people don't experience nerve stimulation, but there are some sequences that some people will. Um, we don't ever really, we aren't ever able to get up into the area though where you might have pain caused by the nerve stimulation or any of these other effects within MRI. Uh, for acoustic safety, um, most of the scanners nowadays will easily exceed 130 dBA which is a measure of the sound pressure, which can potentially lead to hearing damage. You see that's pretty much, it's louder than a, potentially louder than a rock concert or a jet, getting close to what a jet engine would be like if you were very close to it. So again, hearing protection is important. Um, noise attenuating earplugs are recommended for this um, because headphones may not provide sufficient hearing protection. If you look on the headphones from Siemens, they do have a decibel rating on them. And if you read the manuals, it tells you what the maximum um, decibel rating the scanner can reach. Um, I know the Air and Skyr are pretty high. They're around, I think, 120 to 130. So, and the headphones only dissipate about, I think, between 12 and 15. So the headphones are generally not enough protection in all cases to um, protect the hearing and get it below the appropriate level. Um, some of the biological effects that you might run into. Um, so there's vertigo, there's nausea, dizziness, and astigmatism, which basically um, they're caused by a mismatch of signal from the eyes, ears, um, and your proprioception. So this is essentially the dizziness or kind of feeling that people might feel when they put their head in or out of the magnet, magnetic field. Um, some people are much more sensitive to this. Um, after you're exposed to it for a while, usually it doesn't bother you too much though. Um, it's gonna be worse when you're laying down or sitting up. So if the patient does is already being nauseous, it's a good idea to have them sit up and lay down further away from the magnet. Um, some people may also experience a metallic taste as they go into or out of the magnetic field. Uh, there's a magnetohydrodynamic effect. Uh, this one, most, for the most part, you don't have to worry about, um, at least at current field strengths. Um, essentially, it's gonna result in increased blood pressure um, in your major arteries like your aorta. Um, at, I think at 3T, it's still only like maybe a couple to, um, like maybe if it was like maybe two or three um, millimeters in our blood pressure level, so it's not going to be that significant. But as you would get to higher field strength, this is something that we might be, need to be 
concerned about on people who have uh, reduced cardiac output because it could actually reduce their cardiac output further. Uh, of course, EKT, EKG perturbations and flow, uh, flow potentials. So these occur after the QRS during the ST segment and the T wave causing elevation. Um, ST elevation is the first sign of cardiac distress. So it's important that the doctors and nurses in the area know that MRI can cause this so they don't panic if they see this. Um, it also causes gaining issues due to picking up the increased T wave in some cases. Um, because of course your EKG is a voltage detector. Um, if you are getting a really large T wave though, you can try moving the leads around and that can sometimes reduce that. Um, the effect does increase with field strength, so 3T you're gonna have more of an issue than at 1.5. And also ICDs can potentially detect the uh, elevated T wave, inhibiting the ICD from functioning correctly, though um, most of the newer ICDs are uh, programmed so they can detect this. That's one of the reasons I believe they put them in MR mode, because then they are prepared for that. Um, there's also magnetophosphines. These are not harmful. They might be results of uh, light flashes. It's caused by rectal stimulation. Um, could be moved, caused by if you're moving your head or eyes rapidly in the scanner. Um, most people don't experience this again at clinical field strengths, but if someone does, you know, you can just explain what it is and that way that they aren't panicking and cause them more anxiety. So we also have radio frequencies, which is another form of time varying magnetic field. Um, so it's also known as the V1 field. Um, if you're at three Tesla, the RF power is gonna be four times that if you're at a one five. So if you're trying to maintain um, um, your star levels for implants, it'd be much easier at a one five than at a three T. Um, also, if you have someone who's very large or obese and you're worried about making them get very hot, again, doing the scan on a one five is gonna result in less heat. Um, the two ways that this is measured is you have your SAR, which is your specific absorption rate. And you also have, uh, this is more of a physiologic minded measurement that takes into account patient's height and weight. And then there's the V1 plus RMS, which stands for root mean squared. It's better for measuring implant safety. Um, so the operating modes we have, pretty much that we will work with is you have whole body in normal mode and first level mode. So you have two watts in normal and four watts in first level. Head is always 3.2 watts. So it doesn't matter if you're in your first level or normal, or normal mode for that. So on the Siemens scanner, this is kind of what the readout looks like. Um, you have your whole body readout and your head right here. For the most part, those are the ones you'll be focused on. You also may be looking at V1 and RMS for some implants. Um, because if your scanner is set to um, pounds for entering your weight, though, it is going to give you the wrong readout in watts per pound, so you actually need a little conversion chart. You have to do the math for that. Um, you can set the newer scanners to be in metric in the settings, and then it'll put this in watts per kilogram for you. But then you have to basically check a box every time you open up and register a patient. So it just depends on what you want to do with your site. Um, if you're looking again at V1 plus RMS, it's measured in microtesla. There's a display of that. Um, if you're on the GE, it's a little bit blurry, but you can see again, you get your whole body SAR, V1 plus RMS, and like the Tesla down here at the bottom of the screen. And you guys don't want Phillips, we'll see that. Um, so for managing SAR and your V1 plus RMS, so of course, if you want to reduce SAR or V plus RMS, you're going to take SAT bands off, but this might result in a slower motion artifact increase. You can change the RF mode on the scanner. Um, fast is going to be much more significant RF. Um, normal is going to obviously be lower, and then low SAR is much lower below all those. Um, though there are some other effects that this will have on your scan, um, it may increase one of the parameters, which is known as echo spacing. It could increase your scan type, and it might change your TE. Um, if the echo spacing is increasing and you aren't changing any other parameters along the way, that could result in lower quality images or blurring of your data. Can reduce your flip angles or, or take off a refocusing pulse like a restore pulse. Um, this may though reduce your SNR. Increasing your TR will also reduce your um, SAR because you're giving the scan longer to basically acquire that data so the scan time increases. Uh, this will increase your scan time though. Um, your concatenations, you can always, always increase that. Again, that'll increase scan time. 
that echo train length, which you can reduce. Um, that may increase your scan time as well as have other effects. Um, there's an option for hyper echo, which will override your normal flip angle settings. Um, this will tend to preserve your signal in an image from a lower flip angle, but you, it also um, will also result in a little bit higher RF than if you just use the lower flip angle. Um, you can also you change the pulse sequence so you can use gradient echo scans instead of spin echo or fast spin echoes. Um, of course, again, that's going to be changing protocol. It's going to be changing the weighting of your images slightly. Um, you generally want to avoid um, inversion recovery scans if you want to keep the RF lower. Um, and then, of course, you can reduce slices, but that's reduced coverage. And you can also use instead of transmit coil, which is going to limit the RF exposure to a smaller area. So for RF heating in regards to body temperature, um, they, the RF heating is going to be proportional to the rate and time that you're applying that RF. So of course, if you're applying it over a shorter period, more RF deposition results in more body heating um, for a longer period. Um, this is basically what where SAR comes in um, to measure here. When you're measuring uh, the heating of the patient's body itself. Um, the heating is actually caused by electrical resistance in the body. Um, again, if the heat load is greater than the patient's heat dissipation rate, then their body temperature will go up and they're going to start getting uncomfortable, start sweating. Um, anything, if you get a core temperature of the patient up to 104, it can actually be life threatening. So that doesn't generally happen, but there are conditions which a uh, patient's thermal regulation is reduced. And in those cases, if you're using a lot of RF power over a long period, you could actually increase their body temperature to a dangerous level. Um, so for comparison, if you have the basal rate of most people, they can easily handle one watt per kilogram and dissipate that. If you have an in-shape person, they can dissipate heat more readily. So they can go up to about three watts per kilogram without much trouble. Um, athlete can easily um, dissipate six or more watts per kilogram for a sustained duration. So if you have athletes, RF exposure, they might feel a little warm, but it's generally not going to be much of an issue for them. But if you have really unhealthy people, um, if they're more obese, um, then you're going to have to be more concerned about the RF exposure to them. And you may want to consider staying in normal operating mode, or you may question going in first level and make sure it's necessary and I'll do it if it's absolutely necessary. Uh, there was actually an incident that we had at OSU a couple years ago where the patient was in normal operating mode, but they were doing anesthesia, and since the anesthesiologists are usually in the OR, they're used to putting blankets on everyone because everybody gets really cold. They put blankets on it, the text didn't question it, put them in the scanner, scanned the patient for about an hour and a half. When the patient came out, because they weren't monitoring the, pre the um, their body core temperature in the scanner. They were at about 103.4 degrees, their body temperature. So they were actually very close to actually being, having caused harm to the patient from the heating. Brian, so, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, I mean, did that change policy after that happened? Um, yeah, well, it was more an education point. So we educated not only the anesthesiologists, but also we made sure we educated the techs on that. So they're aware of that. Um, also, just to essentially don't put blankets on people. But what about taking the temperature? So they are supposed to be monitoring their temperature. It, I can't believe, I don't think it's in the policy, but it is in like kind of the kind of standard operating procedure. It's not in a specific policy, but because I know sometimes, you know, if they, for some reason, they can't monitor temperature, like if the probes are broken or something, because we've had that happen before. You know, if the patient still needs a test and you have a policy that causes issues. Um, but instead, you know, it's, it was an education point, so people were made aware of the problem and how it needs to be addressed. So anesthesia now is very insistent that they have temperature monitoring. And if not, then the techs know that they need to. But we're like a vent patient. Like we got on our schedule right now a vent patient for a quadruple exam. So nobody's gonna monitor their temperature. So if they're are they if they're sedated, it's a good idea. Now, if you can't monitor their temperature, I'd say keep them in normal operating mode and check on them every now and again. If they're you pay on the medication, you know, most people they get hot, they're gonna start sweating. Though so sometimes if they're under anesthesia, that also may not be the case. And certain medications can also inhibit this. So it's something that you want to be careful, pay attention to. That if you don't have temperature monitoring, you definitely want to be wary of doing really long studies without checking on your patient. So walk in, see if they are hot. And lose the blankets. Yeah, lose the blankets. Don't put blankets. Because the on. people on the vent, they're usually on propofol or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, if they're not conscious, they're, and it's an MRI, 
if you're doing a scan that's getting them warm at all, definitely don't put any blankets on them. So one of the things that comes into play here, you have something known as the SAE or SED. Those are the specific absorbed energy or specific energy dose. Um, there is a limitation that's set. It's at 14.4 kilojoules. This is a uh, measure that most people aren't aware of. It's kind of hidden on the scanner. You don't really see it until, excuse me, on Siemens. If you hit about six kilojoules, you're gonna start getting alerts and pop-ups. Um, when those happen, that doesn't mean you can't continue to scan, but that means that you deposit quite a bit of energy into that patient. And this is the kind of point that if the patient's not alert and oriented, you would definitely want to start checking on them to check on their status, see if they're getting overheated for some reason. So go ahead and like feel their skin, feel their forehead, check their temperature as best you can, even if you don't have uh, some type of remote measurement. Um, let's see here. Software. Yeah, if you have older software, so I know on Siemens below the B level. Until I think recently, it may have been patched. Um, they applied a patch recently to fix this. It would not even alert you of this. It would just stop scanning. So your scanner just wouldn't work. And you try to run a scan and fail, and it wouldn't tell you why. So you have no idea what's going on. Um, this is one reason also why it's important to have accurate height and weight. So this is measured appropriately. Um, if you one the uh, warning on this, if you do start getting this pop up, and you are doing a dynamic scan, it will keep popping up and screw up your dynamic scans. So that's one thing you want to be aware of. Um, you can get rid of this, but you have to delete images off the scanner. So, because it's measuring, I can't remember what the exact right rules are on it, but it's like within the past 24 hours or something, and um, it'll measure, look at all the studies, and there's other, there's certain specific guide, things that the I know Siemens is looking at for it. But if you essentially need to do dynamic scan, then you would actually need to remove some of the images from the scanner. So like send them to your archive and then delete them, and it'll actually get rid of this error. Now that said, that would also allow you to exceed 14.4 kilojoules, which is the regulation limit. So you would want to be careful about that if you start removing things. Um, it's something you probably want to discuss with your MRSO or your radiologist uh, about how to like, what you would like to proceed with on that at that point, uh, time. Um, so some of the factors that do affect thermoregulation of patients, um, of course, obesity is a big one. It's surface to weight ratio. So if you have someone who's very large, has a, is very obese, then it's going to, they're going to heat up a lot more and not be able to dissipate that heat as readily. Um, on the opposite end, if you have infants that you're scanning, they dissipate the heat very easily because they have, their surface to area is very large to weight. Um, Diabetes is one factor. Um, we have hypertension, cardiovascular disease, um, elderly medications can affect this. Um, so a lot of medications, again, that are used during anesthesia can affect thermoregulation. Um, the room temperature has a very large role in this. So if the room's very cold, you're gonna not have as many problems versus if the room's very hot. Um, also humidity plays a role. Um, and then clothing and blankets on the person. Um, so ways that you can dissipate heat, of course, is convection. So increased air and airflow of the patient and room temperature. You have conduction, so contact with a colder object. So if someone's really hot, you could actually put cold packs on them, and that would help cool them down. So put it on the forehead or neck, chest, is going to cool down their body temperature a little bit. So that's one thing to consider. Um, of course, evaporation. So if they're sweating um, and the room humidity is not too high, then this will, or the temperature's not you know, too high, then of course you're gonna dissipate quite a bit of um, heat that way. And then you have radiation, which is just infrared energy used the person's body for being warm. I should say prevent heat dissipation or deposition by skin parameter adjustments, not it. Um, so one other concern we have is for burns. Um, so these are the most common type of RF injury that we run into. Um, there are five different types of burns and different mechanisms that we look at. So there's knee through gear field burns, which are also known as proximity burns, um, conductive loops, we have resonant circuitry, reflected power, and then electrically, electrically conductive circuits and wires. And one thing to note is all burns are 100% preventable. So their patient should never receive a burn in MR unless Going into it, you knew that the burn was a possibility and there was a risk benefit done ahead of time. So there are some cases like the person is very obese, they won't fit in the scanner without appropriate padding. 
you know, you should discuss with a radiologist because at that point there is a potential for a burn. Um, so just some examples here. Of course, tattoos, though, burns generally aren't by tattoos, but it is a possibility. Um, I've actually not seen one, but they have been reported in literature. Um, Near-field burn here. So again, this is from the proximity to the edge of the board for near-field burn. Another near-field burn caused there. And that one actually came from OSU probably about three or four years ago. So near-field burns are the most common, again, are the most common type of burn you run into. Um, they occur in the outer five millimeters of the bore within the RF coil itself. Um, it is not caused by touching the bore, which is a common misconception by people that they think if they put a pet, something there to prevent contact, that'll prevent a burn. It's actually being within that outer five millimeters. So if you put something in that area to keep the patient from touching it, and it's less than five millimeters thick, it will not prevent a burn. Um, people that are most at risk are gonna be larger and obese patients. Um, lateral, shoulders, elbows, and flank are the highest areas of risk. Uh, of course, to prevent these, you want to use more than five millimeters of padding when it's compressed. So if it's a five millimeter pad, it's going to compress less than five millimeters. Um, at OSU, we use a about a one centimeter pad in our uh, policy is what's worded. So that way, when it does get compressed, it's not going to compress down below the five or five millimeter mark. Um, again, sheets and towels, you can use them, but unless they're greater than five millimeters when they're compressed, will not prevent a burn. So, question: If someone is so large that they're not tight in there, that like say the arm pads that we have, like, yeah. which are, like, not, like, is there essentially no point to put anything there? Um, the more you can put, the better, but because if, if five millimeters is, if you're outside five millimeters, you will not get one of these. They will not happen. But and if the closer you are, the, I would say the more risk of that five millimeters. So, well, I'm just saying like some people like who are really tight and then you put like a sheet just so the skin is not in contact. But yeah. Because that, like you said, that wasn't just yeah, it's, it'll prevent them from sticking to the bore and prevent any abrasions or things like right. that that they might get, but it's not going to prevent a burn. I'm just so, curious because I have some people that were hot or the sheets on their arms made them uncomfortable because they were already so tight in there. Yeah. So I guess if the padding doesn't fit in those instances, it would be appropriate. If, if all that can fit is a sheet and that makes them uncomfortable, yeah, you, I would, to not use a sheet. What I would say, use what you can. Um, if you can't use anything or you can't get it appropriate five millimeters in, um, definitely speak with a radiologist on it, um, on what they want to do. So I know it's like, so we had a case where they did this, they went, this person is very large, they were doing a hip, they scanned their hip, the patient got a burn. Uh, but they went in, they talked to the radiologist, they talked to the organ physician, they said, we really need to scan, it's very important. I think they might have had a tumor or something or a really bad infection there. So they said, we really need to see this. So they decided to proceed and the patient did get burned in that process. But it was well documented that they did a risk benefit. They decided the benefit of the study outweighed the risk of the potential burn, so they proceeded anyway. So it's something that you you want to probably talk. You really should talk to a radiologist, and they should discuss it with the ordering team on how to proceed. Is it? Is it and is there a, like a threshold, or like, or is it time? Is it so? Like what? What's it like? Increasing? Like for example, brain without is typically going to be fine, but if you're doing like that, is it position of like so it's anything within the RF coil itself. So if we look right here, um, RF coil is about this big. So this is actually the uh, insert that goes into the bore. So you can see this is the opening. Um, I believe usually they're about, the RF coil will probably be, oh, maybe 50, 40, 50 centimeters or probably 50 centimeters or so. Um, as you do get away from isocenter, there is a drop off in the amount of RF energy. So the closer whatever the body part touching is the isocenter, there's probably an increased risk there. Um, the further to the periphery of your, you know, feasible field of view that it is, there's going to be a less RF exposure, so there's going to be less risk. But it doesn't mean that there's still no risk. And you know, like I said, there's, you know, we did for years. You know, when I was working, you know, we didn't even think about this. We stuck people in the scanner all the time, never had birds. But you know, then one day, you know, it's just like, oh, we got a bird. And it's like, so there's some cases you get them, you might you might not get one for years, and then doing the exact same practice you've been doing, then you get one. So it's not that they're really common, but you know, if you're not trying to be safe and trying to be conscious of this, eventually it is going to happen, or you will get a burn. Good question. Is it like a sunburn where you don't know how bad it will be until later, or would they feel it if they're conscious? So yeah, that's, so that's the next, uh, actually I don't have that part here, so I will have to go over that. So, 
for these, they I think I discussed it later on in the PowerPoint, but they when these birds are occurring, they will not feel the tissue getting burned. They it actually what usually happens is what and I'll just explain it now since we're here. Um, the the basically the what's happening is that your tissue, because it's conductive and it's so close to the RF transmitter is essentially becoming part of the circuitry due to the wave the wavelength of RF we're using. So it effectively became part of that RF transmission coil. And the highest resistance tissue you have in your body is your fat. So what happens is the fat basically starts to heat up, but your fat doesn't have any pain sensory nerves. So you don't realize that it's getting hot. And since fat's a really good insulator, it slowly releases all that energy that's getting being deposited into it into the surrounding tissues. So what happens is, since it's a slow trend temperature increase, they don't realize they're getting burned. Um, so that burn is slowly occurring. It could be, um, it can even actually, after you pull someone out of the scanner, a burn could actually develop over 15 minutes after you pull them out of the scanner. If it was started, if it was initiated, you know, right before you pull them out. So it's something that they can occur just gradually over time. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss that in a little more detail uh, on, in a little bit. Yeah, they will not feel these burns. So it's not like they can squeeze them on and say, hey, I'm getting, I'm getting burned. Once they feel it, they're, they've been burned for probably a while. So they're not gonna notice it until it's too late. Uh, one of the other ones, uh, types of burns that we have to worry about is of course creating conductive loops. Um, any conductive material forming a large loop can have a current generated by the RF energy. Um, and then if that, uh, loop gets focused in a small region, then it's going to focus that energy in that small region. So the reason I have this picture here is your body tissues are also conductive. So if you have created a large loop over your head with your arms here, and your hands are touching, in a small contact area, you can actually get a burn if your arms are in the, any part of your arms, chest area is in that RF exposure area. Um, obviously, if you're skating knee, not a problem. But if you're skating their abdomen, chest, head, anything like that, their arms are over their head and touching there is a possibility they could actually get a burn where that contact point is. Um, similarly on their side, you have a loop crate with your arms and your tissue on your side. Um, if there is any contact there, of course if they're wearing scrubs, that is preventing contact. Um, but if their scrubs are saturated with sweat because they're sweating a lot, that could again create a conductive loop. Same thing with your feet, again from your left toes, to your hips, or toes all the way up to your pelvis and down, that also has created a very large loop. So you could get a burn there, um, your knees is also another location. Um, one of the areas that we, at OSU, this was probably 15 years ago, that they had this occur was for a research patient. They had a tumor removed from their leg and they'd been doing aggressive physical therapy because you know the muscle of that loss they had. And their calves had actually gotten bigger. So most people, their calves don't touch, but they were doing, scanning this, the tumor on their leg to look if it had grown back at all. And because their calves were touching, it created a very large conductive loop between their calves and their pelvis. And this person actually got a third degree burn where their cats were barely touching. Um, of course, ways to prevent this is if you prevent skin to skin contact, that'll prevent it. Um, also, if you have a large contact area, then the energy is dissipated over that larger area. So if you have like your fingers are touching just like this, there's a high risk of a burn there. But if you're gripping your hands solidly like that, then there's large area for that energy to be dissipated over. So it's not gonna heat up. Um, still has the same amount of energy going through, but it's not going to get really hot in a focal spot that's going to cause a burn. Um, it's the thing that kind of like a light bulb, that a light bulb, you have a film that gets really thought fine and gets really hot. It's the same idea. So it's only skin to skin. So if someone has like um, like the pants that we are outpatients and they have socks on and they cross their legs and their skin not touching this. Yeah, not as long as it's not conductive or in, in conductive, then it won't work. So you're, it won't, this is the problem. So if you have scrubs or you have clothing covering it, unless they're sweating so much that it's like saturated and it's now conductive because of all the liquid, then there's no chance of this happening. So we also have resonant circuitry. This is known as the RF antenna effect. Um, this is also one of the main concerns with implants, why we're concerned about them and they have different RF uh, SAR values for those and there are RMS value restrictions. Um, this is where heating of wires can occur. Um, for that to happen though, there are some length or some uh, lengths that you need to reach. So if something is less than um, six centimeters at 3T, it will not heat up from RF. If you're at 1.5T, it has to be less than 12 centimeters. So if there's an object, you know it's less than that, there isn't a risk of heating. 
um, it only requires a portion of the object to be exposed. So if you have a big long lead in someone and it's completely outside the RF field, not a problem. But if it's any part of it is in the RF field, even if it's only like an inch or two, it's going to get it be exposed to RF and it can absorb the RF and then it can actually transmit it along that lead and it'll have a very hot spot at the other end of the lead you're at both ends actually. So this is why PBS is a kid, you have to follow those very carefully um, because if for instance part of it is exposed to RF that it's supposed to or you're exceeding the RF limits then it'll conduct that along that lead and it can basically which is going right into the brain you basically have an ablative tip in the brain you're going to cause birds there. Um, anything that's pointy is worse going to be worse for this so one of the reasons why this isn't a major concern for a lot of spinal hardware that we run into hip implants um, femur rods and things like that is because they're in your body and they're you know there's objects moving around them they tend to be very rounded edges so because they're around the edge that um, dissipation of energy is going to be much more broad across the end there um, if instead like you have say broken spinal hardware now you have a sharp pointy edge there's actually a much higher risk of uh, there being an injury from heating in that area. So if the hardware is actually broken, it's something you may want to discuss with your MRSO, talk to radiologists to discuss you know, if you should, how, to, how to proceed with that. Um, something else to point out that the um, amount of heating you get from things, it is the same throughout the scanner. The closer you are to the RF transmitter, which as we saw earlier is the outer side of the bore, then the higher risk there is for heating from these effects. So the further away, the closer to the center of the magnet, it's going to be less of an issue, but that's more of an issue thing to do for your, uh, again, your safety officer to evaluate in certain cases. That as a tech, you're going to be following the guidelines for most things. Um, we also have reflected power. So um, RF can be reflected off of an object. So things that are like, um, you can think of it like either a satellite dish or a magnifying glass that energy is being focused. Um, so the reason this is one reason why medication patches, if they have foil backs, a lot of times we'll have, have those to remove. Why there's not a high risk from those, there is potential of um, increased RF deposition in some areas. That can again lead to a burn. Um, or the object itself, if it's large enough, could heat up. Um, and again, myron blankets can are don't ever bring those in MR. Um, metallic fiber shirts also, this could either be from the object conducting the RF itself and heating up, or it could be uh, reflecting the RF power and focusing on a larger area. So this is again why we would want to change everybody out of their outside clothing into scrubs in our environment, because depending on what the material is made of, especially a lot of athletic wear um, and the anti-odor, antibacterial things, um, they may have their threading actually impregnated with um, some type of metal or silver ions, which may make the material conductive, and then it can heat up in the MRI. We also have electrically conductive circuits and wires. Um, so any wires you have in MR, of course, you need to make sure that it's an MR conditional object if you have it in there. If it isn't, then of course there's a fire hazard, there's burn risks. Um, for these, the patient will definitely know they're getting burned. because This is gonna be superficial to for them. So if it's laying on their skin and it gets hot, they're gonna feel it, assuming they're alert and oriented. Not that you should have it in there, but you know that at least they can alert you to that. Um, prevention, of course, you want thermal insulation on all your wires. This also applies to your coils. If the insulation on your coils is damaged, you shouldn't be using them because those are wires. If there's any damage to the coils and then the insulation is also damaged, they can heat up as well. Um, also, if they go expose, like if you they have that thin that insulation on the coil, if the coil is being pushed up against the side of the scanner. Same thing, that could actually become part of that RF antenna circuitry, and it'll absorb the RF directly if that coil could get very, very hot. So again, this is one reason you want to make sure that um, insulation is intact on your coils. Again, this is also why you don't cross your loop coils. If there is the insulation, cross your looping shouldn't matter, but again, it's just safe practice not to ever cross your loop coils. Especially if you're on older scanners where they don't have that thick insulation layer. Um, so what I was saying earlier, um, for the near field and conductive loop burns, um, burns are initiated in the fat. Um, there is no pain sensory nerves in the fat, so the patient isn't going to feel that burn. And the burn may appear slowly even after the MR is completed. 
So the signs that a burn is imminent, that it's what is occurring in the process right now, is the patient may feel itching, a pain, or tingling sensation in a region. So if they ever experience any of those sensations in an area that is a high risk area for a burn, I'd be you want to apply first aid for that. So um, the first aid for this is immediate placement of a cold compress on the area. Um, I know a lot of times with like injuries, sports injuries, they say don't place the ice pack directly on the skin. In this case, you want to place the ice pack directly on the skin uh, because you want to cool off as quickly as possible. Um, of course, you want to monitor on the area, so you don't want to leave it on there for like 20 minutes and freeze it, you know, cause damage, any tissue damage from that, but immediately you do want to get that cold object right on there. Um, again, this is going to limit damage to the surrounding tissue and act as a heat sink to pull that heat out of the tissue in that area. Um, again, just use ice in a plastic bag, place directly on the area, um, has a very fast heat transfer rate. Um, cryogens um, are also a safety point we need to discuss. Of course, we all know they're very cold. Um, the primary concern would be from cryogen leaks because they can distill O2 out of the air, which can be a fire hazard. Also, they're extremely cold, so you want to avoid any skin contact if, if you did ever find a cryogen leak. Um, in case of any leaks, you want to evacuate the area and contact service and power down your system. So for um, this is just a little chart here that kind of goes over some of the different concerns um, on the left. So if you have like your static field and then the concerns so they have rotational, translational forces, this little like useful chart. Um, I'll get a net a copy of the PowerPoint slides. You guys can look at that later as well if you use that. Um, emergency preparedness in the MR. Um, if you have any emergency medical situation, you should evacuate the patient from the room first. Um, I know it's you again, we, before we even call a code, we evacuate our room. Because last thing you want is a whole code team trying to run into the room, and then we have more safety injuries and all sorts of other problems. So first thing is you evacuate the patient, um, and of course for fire safety you want to be familiar with your fire evacuation procedures. Um, if you ever find a thermomagnetic object stuck to the MR scanner, the first thing you should do is evacuate the room. Um, you should only remove the object once the room has been evacuated, and then only attempt to do so if it can be done easily by hand. Um, and you also should notify your support advisor or your MR safety officer as your site dictates. Um, so that is quench button. Of course, do not push the quench button unless it's going to save someone's life or prevent further injury. So if someone is pinned to the magnet, magnet by something, that might be a time for the quench button. If something's just stuck to the magnet and you're worried about getting in trouble, not a good time for the quench button because that's going to get you way more trouble. Um, if the magnet is quenched, that could also damage, one, well, it could damage the magnet. Um, it could also, um, even if it doesn't damage the magnet, it can result in tens of thousands of dollars of cost for replacing the cryogens and also loss of revenue. So unless it's a safety, go to save someone's life, don't push that button. Um, also the emergency stop button, remember that is not the quench button, that just cuts power to the magnet. So that's for use if there's sparking, equipment damage, fire, like the table won't stop trying to go in the scanner or something weird's going on, that's when you might use that button. Um, again, code blue situations, evacuate people from the magnet. Um, code is gonna be conducted in a specific area in your MR. You should, everyone should be aware of where that's going to be, so that way everyone knows and can act appropriately. Um, emergency removal of subjects should be practiced. That way, again, so you're very familiar with the process. Um, crash cart, at least in any place I've been, is not MR safe. So again, make sure that everyone is aware of that. And if I would actually put a sticker or something on it to identify it as such. Um, if again, they get rotated in circulation, you always have the same one, you can always use a not MR safe like magnet, magnet or something that sticks to it. That way you can just swap between carts. Um, again, finding unknown objects, if you do, um, if you want to stop the MR study, make sure you remain calm. Um, check on the safety of a patient. Make sure they're doing okay. Remove the patient slowly from the scanner. You don't want to rotate or have them move at all though until they're clear and far away from the magnet. Um, if it is something that would change orientation when you twist the table to the side as you're pulling away, then that could cause it to torque in their body and potentially cause harm. Um, 
And so again, you want to bring the table as straight out as possible until you have to turn the table. Um, if you can identify the object, remove it if possible. Um, if there's any concern of harm to the patient, then of course you would immediately contact your radiologist and seek medical treatment. Um, at this point, you would determine if the study can be resumed. Uh, if it's an object you found and you feel you can resume the study, then do so. For psychological distress, of course there's, um, as we know, claustrophobia, anxiety, depression, panic disorders. Um, easiest ways to limit these, um, communicate your expectations to a patient. So being very clear on what you expect of them, um, tell them what they can move, when they can move, is very useful to the patient and will alleviate a lot of their stress. Um, if possible, it may help if there's a friend or family in the room with them. Sometimes that will help people with their stress and relieve some of the uh, anxiety. Um, you can play music for many patients. You can get eye coverings or blindfolds. Um, you can practice certain relaxation techniques. So, you know, having them take some deep breaths and out before they go in. Tell them to do practice imagery. Think of a, like their favorite place, going there, what they want to do. Maybe some vacation or something they want to do. Just try to take their mind off of process that you're going through. Um, also, you can do off-license center imaging on many scanners. Um, so if they aren't very claustrophobic, you, depending on the study, you may be able to um, set like a fixed table position to have their head further out the scanner. That may make them more comfortable. Um, depending on the study, that may not be possible. So MR contrast. So gadolinium, there's currently seven agents in the U.S. market. Um, and there's also super pure magnetic iron oxide agents. Um, the one that's most common is ferromoxetol. Um, again, ferromoxetol is not very common. Um, it's used occasionally for a contrast agent MR. Um, like if someone has, say, really poor renal function or something, they may use that. Um, I think we've used it, uh, we've used it a couple times over at OSU, but not too often. Contrast, of course, should only be administered by a trained professional. Gadolinium is not nephrotoxic, unlike CT agents. Um, Gadolinium-based contrast agents are not currently recommended for use during pregnancy. Um, another misconception that I hear is people think that you need to discontinue breastfeeding. Um, the amount of uh, gadolinium that is passed into breast milk is negligible, and then the amount absorbed by the infant is even less. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it's like 0.004%. I believe gets into the infant system from breast milk, so it's not really, there's probably a higher background levels than that. So again, don't be discontinued breastfeeding, but if the um, patient's concerned, they're more than welcome to. Um, and of course, you have nephrogenic systemic fibrosis as a concern. <laughs> so gadolinium agent stability. So if you're looking at the most stable agents are gonna be the macrocyclic ionic agents. The least stable agents are going to be linear and non-ionic. Um, basically, less instability means that more gadolinium will be free when after the injection and deposit in their tissues. So, we look at the chart here. Um, so, macrocyclic ionic is going to be the best ones. This is why a lot of places have switched to using deuterium because it is macrocyclic and ionic. So gadolinium is known to deposit in um, different tissues, regardless of what agents use, um, even with normal kidney function. Um, there isn't any evidence to harm in the state, but the FDA and people are definitely looking into research on this. Um, the only known adverse event, health event, is from NSF. Um, but the FDA is also now requiring uh, patients to be given a medication guide for the first time they're given, uh, they're receiving the agent, or if any time they might request that. So if you have contrast reactions, of course, emergency medication boxes should be available. This might be a crash part here. Um, if you're in an outpatient facility, it may be in some type of medication area that you have access to. Um, if you have a history of reaction, um, once again, this is always used what we do. We make sure all those are done at a hospital instead of an outpatient facility. Um, we want to identify the specific, <coughs> specific agent use, then use a different agent. So screening. Um, Everybody that's going into zone three, which is again the area outside of the MR door, um, should be screened. 
Um, and this includes patients, technologists, nurses, physicians, housekeeping staff, facilities. Anyone who has access to that area should absolutely be screened. Um, screening forms will be reviewed by an MR technologist or, again, level two trained personnel. Um, who can give a good history? Of course, this is a coherent patient, uh, immediate family or significant other. Um, and a radiologist may also clear patients by a risk benefit assessment. So, example of the screening form, most everything's electronic nowadays though. Um, some screening tips, of course, don't move too quickly. Um, it's your job as a technologist in that screen to ensure this, uh, the person's safety. Try to have a conversation with them. The screening form is primarily a tool to use. So make sure when they don't just read it verbatim and then just move on. You know, if there's anything that does bring up any concerns or maybe there needs to be some clarifications, make sure you delve deeper into those. Um, and then of course, confirm to accuracy and totality of your responses. Um, you want to read back any surgeries, procedures, make sure they're not missing anything. Um, of course, you guys all know different contraindications for MRI. But all implants should be, um, have to be identified prior to enter, entry into MRI, unless you have a guideline or policy dictating how to deal with them. Changing patients, um, all patients should be changed into safe provided clothing, remove all permanent objects, any metallic threads, decorations, metallic piece of clothing doesn't need to be removed. Um, undergarments and can also contain this, so depending on your institution, I recommend that you are removing them because there is a possibility, especially um, some of the damage these modern fabrics, they're advertising them as antibacterial, antimicrobial, um, anti-odor things. It is a possibility that those could have conductive threads in them and they could heat up and nobody wants to get burned there. Um, let's see here. Again, if you're a fan, the family's going through the room, if they're not entering the bore, not really concerned about RF, but you still do have all the ferromagnetic concerns. So again, you should change that as well. Implants get classified into three categories. You have things that are MR safe, MR unsafe, MR conditional. Um, so MR safe means the device has shown, um, has been shown to pose no risk to the subject or um, patient in any environment. Uh, the object is non-magnetic, non-metallic, and non-conductive. So an example of this is a plastic catheter, or something made of silicon, maybe a vortex graft, different types of cloth. Um, like an example of things that are MR safe. MR conditional, um, it's been shown to know, pose no hazards at specific conditions. So this is gonna be things that um, they may be non-ferromagnetic, they might have conditions for their use, uh, maybe things that are slightly ferromagnetic, like the conditional. So most objects that go in MR are actually gonna fall into this category. And of course we have MR unsafe, which is devices pose um, hazard in all environments. Um, an older term that you might run into on some old documentation is things that say MR compatible. Just be very wary of this term. Um, it could mean safe or conditional, so it's hard to know which. Um, so it's a good idea to talk to MR so if you ever run into that. So implant documentation. Um, one of the important things, of course, you need to review the manuals prior to scanning these patients so you're familiar with what the conditions are that you can safely scan the patient. Um, there are charts that you'll find. A lot of vendors and a lot of people um, advertise those and they'll show, oh, look at this chart, it's very useful. That's great, but it often doesn't have all the information you need to know. Um, some of them, um, some of the information that you might find on that like some of these charts is heard that might be missing. I think there's, uh, what's it, some of the shunts that people have. One of the important things that says in the instructions but isn't in these charts that they might list is that the patient shouldn't be rotating their head more than a certain number of degrees. And if they do, it can undo the locking mechanism for the shunt, which would then allow it to adjust the settings. So if the patient's turning their head in the scanner, that might actually unlock the device and it might adjust the settings of the device. Um, so that's important information to know that you can then relate to the patient so that you tell them not to turn their head. And if they do, then you want to make sure that you document that and you know, you address that appropriately afterwards. So a lot of conditions are reported in the documentation for implants. You might see field strength, the spatial gradient limits, um, slew rate limits, a DVDT limit. Um, 
RF, you might see SR, V1 plus RMS, or any ice heating. It might be coil limitations, scan time limits, or other things such as patient position, device location, exclusion zones, orientation of device, configuration and mobilization of a device, and then pre and post MR instructions. These are all things when you're reading this manual you want to keep an eye out for and make sure you're not just going looking for, oh, where's the star reading here, and then just read one paragraph and then move on. You want to look above and below that, make sure you're not missing anything. So again, here's a nice little chart that is very useful, but has significant amount of information missing. Um, I, we've had issues with patient uh, text misinterpreting this, where it says full body eligible to report. They assume that means the patient's full body eligible. That is not what that means. It means that the, a report can be ran to determine whether they're full body eligible, which needs to be done. So I've had um, one, there, we've had at least one patient that got scanned inappropriately by a tech, luckily they were injured, that was not fully body eligible then because of the tech misinterpreted this on the chart. But if they read the manual, the manual clearly tells them how to proceed instead of using this chart. So this is very good for scheduling purposes, knowing that they can get an MRI, but not so much as how to do the MRI. So some examples of what you might see for field strength. Um, you, might, you might read at three Tesla, up to three Tesla, three Tesla or less, only three Tesla, 1.5 and three Tesla. So I want to make sure you're following exactly what it says. Um, if it doesn't, so for instance, if it says at three Tesla, that doesn't mean it's safe at 1.5. Um, and if it says, again, if it says only three Tesla, it says three Tesla or less, that means anything below. Um, it is possible that you could have implants that are perfectly fine at three Tesla and at one five they are gay. It can be harmful to the patient. Um, I know the DBSs are generally considered conditional at one five, but if you put them on a one Tesla, which you don't have here, but if you put them on one, you could actually cause a severe burn by following the same guidelines if you just did them on one Tesla instead. So again, it is very important you follow read the, the exact wording and make sure you understand what that means. Um, these uh, decisions are made by, again, the RF frequency, and then usually torque or rotation alignment with these zeros, usually why the field strength limitations are in place. And again, um, there's also one of the things for field strength that may say an open bore. Um, if there is a, like the, the two, like, you know, you see the two disc style magnets in some places, those are a vertical field, whereas uh, the bore magnets are horizontal field. So the safety implications would actually be very different for those two different magnets. So if you ever scan on those, to one with the two discs, or if they're one where like this upright MRI where they can sit down in it, then they're on the side, if you ever see those. Um, most of the safety information out there does not apply to those. So if you, again, the you one, have to get a safety officer involved. Yeah, the one that we have at Ohio Health, they, the techs call rads almost on every implant. Yeah. Um, because the spatial grade, everything is different on those. Yeah, the spatial gradients are different. The amount of force that pulls near the, near the board is actually, if you're like right up here at the plates, it's extremely strong compared to an open board magnet, but further away, it's weaker. Um, the RF field is oriented differently, so there's actually, again, you know, implants might heat differently, the orientation of the implant might need to be different, so there's all sorts of stuff that comes into play there. Um, just a brief thing for people to understand how the magnetic testing is done. So, when they do implant testing for measuring um, like going with the field strength and then giving you spatial gradient values, what they actually do is they essentially attach the object to a protractor or a string and a protractor and they measure the deflection angle. Um, when they say it's whatever values you're giving, so say we have an implant that said it can go up to 720 gauss per centimeter. What that basically tells me is the deflection of that object was less than 45 degrees at 720 gauss, gauss per centimeter. That's all that's really telling me. It could be five degrees, it could have been zero degrees. Really, there's no way for me to know what it was, but what a way to um, kind of evaluate these is if you have an object, once it hits 45 degrees, that basically is telling you that the amount of force from the magnet is equal to the force of gravity. And during daily activities, that implant's gonna experience, experience more force than gravity will on a regular basis. So if you're walking up and down the stairs, the G-forces on that is gonna be like one to two G-force just from walking up and down stairs. 
you jump way flat on your feet, you're probably hitting like say three G's of force suddenly. Um, so just during get activities, you're experiencing more than the force of gravity on this implant. So spatial gradient limits, well, again, you should follow them. There is kind of, you know, don't just say, oh, I can't, I absolutely can't follow this. The patient has to be canceled. It's something you should discuss with your MRSO a little more detail um, because it may not actually be as, as strict a contraindication as you think it is. So before you cancel someone for spatial gradient limits, you definitely want to speak with them. Um, explain that. Um, so yeah, the, the example of this is the Zenith AAA graft. So it actually deflects more than 45 degrees because it's highly ferromagnetic, but after more testing, it's been listed as MR conditional. So I know you have your uh, ferromagnetic and magnetic detector. Um, if someone has one of those, that's gonna set it off. So it'll be going off on this, like even the uh, conditional implants, it may set it off. If they're um, slightly ferromagnetic, it may detect them. So it's just one thing to be aware of with that as well. Um, you don't run into these too much anymore where you might see the slew rate of something. Um, for the most part, this isn't something that we really have control over as a tech. So at OSU, when we see it, we basically ignore it. I'm not telling you to do so. I'm just saying it's things to consider. <coughs> because as a tech, we can't really control this easily. Uh, this is more controlled when the sequence is programmed and by the gradient strength in your scanner. Um, one thing that you can do though, if you want to reduce the slew rate, um, you can change your gradient mode. So you can go to like uh, normal mode from fast or to whisper mode. That's going to lower the slew rate using thicker slices, um, lower frequency resolutions, lower bandwidth, avoid EPI and other fast readout scans such as your uh, Fiestas, True Feeds, um, Pace scans, things like that are all going to be really rapid readouts. Any single shot of imaging. Um, also, if the object is closer to the ISO center, then the switching of this R of the gradients is going to be um, affected much less. So, if you have, for instance, an object at the very center at ISO center, um, when the gradients are switching rapidly, it's not going to vibrate very much, and there's not going to be um, as much of a concern. Versus if it's out towards the periphery, out here, then the change is going to be much more strong and rapid. So, it's going to vibrate much more. Um, so the RF field, of course, is known as the V1 field. Um, as I mentioned earlier, at 3T, um, it's going to be four times the RF power as a 1.5 scanner. It also increases by the power of two with the clip angle. So if you do 180 degree balls versus a 90 degree, it's going to have four times the amount of RF power to get that RF pulse. Um, this is, again, measured by SAR, your specific absorption rate, and V1 plus RMS. Um, so for SAR, again, there's no real um, universal standard for SAR measurements. Um, the different vendors have different algorithms they use, so one scanner might be a little bit different. It's one reason why SAR is not really good for measuring heating of implants and why it's so restrictive in many cases. Um, if you have the option to use V1 plus RMS, you definitely want to use that in it instead. Um, again, also SAR is proportional to the power of five of patient circumference, so if you double someone's waist, then it's going to be 32 times the amount of RF that required to do the scan. So it really, that's one reason why I've been a really small person versus a large person, why you have so many issues with SAR on them. Um, V1 plus RMS, it's the magnitude of the positive component of the V field, V1 field, and it's measured in microtesla. So instead of SAR, which isn't precisely a known value because of different vendor approximations, V1 plus RMS is a specific known value that's calculated directly from the scanner. Um, it's not an estimate. So and the value is based on your sequence and the parameters you select. Um, so if you run one scan with a specific V1 plus RMS and you don't change any parameters, you'll always have that exact same value. So you don't touch your TR, resolution, anything like that, then you'll have the exact same V1 plus RMS value every time you pull that scan over. Um, for measuring SAR and V1 plus RMS, you want to add a pause to your scan. Um, you prepare the scan, wait for it to pause, then check the values under the prediction tab. Um, on Siemens, report SAR again as a percent, so you can use a SAR chart to do the math. 
or as I mentioned earlier, you can set your scanners to being in uh, metric instead of um, US units or your unit there. Um, the one plus RMS is also reported as a percent, but if you click on the percentage, it will give you the value in microtesla at the bottom. So you don't have to do any calculations for that one. So again, that's what I showed earlier. If you instead clicked on the one plus RMS, it would show you the value in microtesla right there. So that's what that glory picture is right there. And again, GE showing you plus RMS down the bottom there. So coil terms that you might run into in documentation. So these are ones that sometimes people get confused by. We have a transmit body coil is the coil built into the MR scanner. The transmit receive head coil, which is the inverted cage pod style coil that's open at the top and bottom. Um, a local transmit coil is any coil that is not the body transmit coil. Um, usually they'll, you'll see that on something where they say don't place any local coil over top. That's what they're referring to. Um, a receive coil is any non-transmitting coil. Um, and again, this is one mis thing that I see from a, the labeling is kind of incorrect on. They will say not to place any local coil over the device. Um, because the insulation, unless the coil is damaged and it's insulated properly, um, there isn't going to be any issue of using any receive coil over top of any device. Only if it was a transmit coil would that be an issue. But again, you can have policies on that at your location and discuss with your MRSO so if you're not uh, clear on that. So again, coil types, we have transmit, which is also known as TXRX or TR. Um, transmit coils are able to receive, though they may not be good or designed for it. So the building body coil you can't actually receive with, but you're going to get really bad pictures if you do so. Uh, primarily it's used for transmission. And you have receive only coils. Um, and in these cases, the built-in body coil is the one that's doing the transmitting. Um, your transmit coil modes, so there's linearly polarized. This is an old technology. Um, so you'll see some things that say a coil has to be um, CP or circularly polarized. Uh, and with all the current coils out there that I'm aware of, they're all circularly polarized. They're not using linear polarization. Um, the reason why that matters is if it's linearly polarized, there's going to be um, higher RF power closer to the one side where the antenna is or the transmission is. So you're going to have higher RF in some areas versus others. Um, circularly polarized, which is going to be all your modern transmit coils. It's sometimes also referred to as quadrature transmission. You also have elliptically polarized coils. So this is different from circularly polarized. Um, and it's used to actually reduce RF power compared to circularly polarized. So it's actually going to be safer than circularly polarized mode. Um, it's the default for a lot of scanners, unless you change that in the protocol, uh, once you get away from the head. Um, the newer software on Siemens, I believe you do have the option to select this, but it defaults to head, it defaults to circularly polarized, and the body and everything else. It's going to default to uh, elliptically polarized. Um, the reason they do that, again, it reduces SAR and RF exposure. The downside is it does reduce V1 field homogeneity. So if you're having issues with um, loss of signal in like your abdomen studies, that's uh, elliptically polarized is actually going to make that worse. So if you can change it to circularly polarized, that's actually going to help a little bit. Um, coil identification, the best ways to do this, of course, is you can look at the coil. Often they'll have a sticker or label telling you what they are. Um, they may say receive only, TX, RX, TR, transmit, or transceiver. You can also look at coil plugs. Um, the coil pins will help you identify that. Um, usually the, there's coil identification pins, there's receive channel pins, and there's also a transmit pin in some coils. Um, other pins, there might be plastic placeholder or blocking pins. You can also contact the manufacturer, manufacturer, give them a serial number, and they can tell you what the coil is. Um, there's also GE specific info. If you see an average coil SAR pop up on your SAR display at the bottom, that does mean it's a transmit receive coil. And our average coil SAR not being listed means it's a receive only. So just some pictures of those coils. So if we look at coil identification, so here's some coils for Siemens here. So most of your scanners here probably have this type of coil. So in that case, you've got a transmit pin right here. You can see it's a larger pin. We have receive channel pins right here. And then we have coil identification pins there. 
So you'll note that there is no receive channel pin. So this is a receive only coil, whereas this is a transmit receive coil. You see both the transmit and receive pins on it. Um, the older GD scanners, after, or older Siemens scanners, this was a receive only plug. Uh, I'm not aware of any appearance of the old transmit plugs. They look pretty much like these guys from what I've seen. Um, for a GD scanner, you may have these types of plugs. Um, so these are some of the older design. Again, you see the transmit pins and then the receive channel pins, and the coil identification pins here. Um, again, this one on the newer GE scanner plugs, you have these are your transmit pins. This is a locking pin for the coil, and these are coil identification and receive channel pins. So the main thing you're looking at is you look at the plug. If you see these here, you know it's a transmit plug. So some of the other implant information, you might have scan time limits. So you'll see, say if it says three watts per kilogram for 15 minutes of scan. If scanning, it means that implant was tested running the scan for 15 minutes. That doesn't mean you can only scan for 15 minutes. It's just saying that that's how the testing was done. Um, some will say that it means that you can only run a single scan for 15 minutes. I don't really interpret that way either. It's just really telling you how the testing was done. Um, instead, it could, uh, conversely to that, um, if you see one that says MR scan duration should not exceed until 30 minutes of active scan time within a 90 minute window, this does mean that you can't have more than 30 minutes of running scans during that 90 minutes. So when you hit that 90 minute window, it would then you'd either have to wait or you'd have to do risk benefit assessment through with a radiologist to decide how to proceed at that time. So an example, if your first scan started at 9 a.m., and once you hit your active 30 minutes of scanning, say at 9.45, you wouldn't be able to run anything else until it was 10.30 to stay on label for that implant. Uh, one thing I actually do at OSU is since it does say it's 3 watts per kilogram, um, for that 30 minute period, or it's for instance, it might say 3 watts or it might say 2 watts, whatever it is, I'll take, um, Sometimes I'll do weighted averages and discussion with radiologists for its benefit, but again, that's more for the safety officer probably to discuss with them than you guys. Um, patient position may also be very specific. Um, in the manual for the DBSs, it says do not position the patient um, on their side, in the lateral of the cube and the MR bore. Um, basically, here I think this is more of a CYA on their part that. If you're, I or maybe ensuring that their head is in the ISO center, not too far to the side. But that said, you know, it does give you these directions. If you're going to have to go off these for some reason, again, it would be a risk benefit assessment. Um, you might have device location limits. So for VNS, the location, it says, you know, it should be basically above the armpit or above rib four. If for some reason it's not above rib four, then again, that would make change how you have to do your scan. Um, and you need to go to a radiologist and discuss for a with them. Um, again, for exclusion zones, um, there may be, so this one says if you're using a transmit RF coil, then it, you can scan from C7 to T8 um, for header extremity coils. If you're using the built-in body coil, though, then that exclusion zone extends down to L3. <coughs> and also, this is a one that, if you look, if you're using the transfer body coil, that 15 minutes of active scan time within a 30 minute window. So once you get 15 minutes, again, you've got to wait until 30 minutes is up before you can start scanning again. Uh, this is also one where it does discuss, you see it says circularly polarized mode. I don't understand what this no shimming is supposed to mean. Um, maybe that's gotten a good answer on that one, but I think that's really just nonsense. No, I haven't gotten a good answer on that. <laughs> Because shimmy wouldn't have anything to do with your RF exposure, really. Um, so I don't understand why that, that what they mean by that. But um, but saying it's circularly polarized coil, again, that's pretty much every coil that you have that you use would fall under that. Um, device orientation, again, certain uh, like the synchromed bump does specify do not have a vertical of the scanner. That is a challenge, not too much of a challenge usually, but if you have someone's really obese and the device is off the side, it could actually end up vertical. Um, and the reason why that is they do that is it puts stress on the pump, which can then cause it to stall, and then the pump may have to be really starting up appropriately. 
Um, it also has specific pre and post instructions for implants, such as stimulators, pacemakers, ICDs, pain pumps, uh, programmable shunts and valves. Um, there may also be wait times. You don't see them commonly that much anymore, but sometimes you'll still see a wait time listed for an implant. Um, the idea for this is you want to let the implant anchor into the tissues before it's exposed to some of the forces from the MRI. So just an example of some things that you see when you look at uh, implant info. Of course, this one says three Tesla or less, which would include one five, one Tesla, anything else below that. Um, you have a spatial gradient of 720 gauss per centimeter. Um, again, that just means that that's what they tested that, and it didn't exceed a 45 degree deflection. So, again, it's not a, a strict contraindication, but you want to discuss it with your safety officer and or your radiologist if you're going to exceed that for any reason. Um, the maximum whole body SAR, 3 watts per kilogram for 15 minutes of scanning, means, again, just limit yourself to three watts per kilogram for all your scans. Don't go over that, and you should be fine. And then this also says that uh, you had a temperature rise of 0.83. So this is testing in basically a phantom. So at three watts per kilogram, it didn't get more than 0.8. So what that tells me as a safety officer that one, if this is a stent, it's going to be in a vessel. There's going to be flow that cools it off. Plus, it's going only at 0.8 degrees. So if I was at four watts, chances are it's not going to heat up that much more and it's gonna be well below the three degrees, which is really what's considered safe. So even at four degrees, four watts, while that would be off-label and you have to get approval from a radiologist, if there was some reason you needed to go over three watts, I wouldn't have any problem calling a radiologist and explaining you know, why I need to go over three watts. But unless you, again, it's risk-benefit with a radiologist, you should be following the labels. I have a question. Yeah. I had an implant the other day that the spatial gradient was 240, and I've never seen one that low. 240 gauss per centimeter. Yeah, I don't think I've seen that low either. Um, I've seen 2400 on some, but that's usually extra, the, the, a lot of those are extrapolated. But if it says 240, I, well, I get all the information you can on it. Um, again, what I explained before that that means that they tested at 240 and it deflected less than the 45 degrees, which means it would have. The magnet at 240 will put equal to or less than the force of gravity on that device. And you know, like I said, everyday activities are getting probably double the force of gravity from things. So even with that, with the discussion with the radiologist, I would still say probably upwards of two to three times that value with a risk benefit assessment might be reasonable. Uh, again, encountering looking at what the device is made of, you know, can you determine it? Is it something that might be ferromagnetic? Is it only slightly ferromagnetic and maybe just the testing was done on a magnet that only had access to that area. So it's really hard to say for sure. Um, that's one reason why, again, we follow it, but if you ever see one that you can't, don't think you can meet, it shouldn't be a, oh, we're canceling this patient. It should go to, for further discussion with your MRSO or radiologist. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen one that low. I think the lowest I've seen is about 360 or maybe 500 before. Um, let's see if I have the... Uh, I'll go back to the map and we'll go through that in a second. Um, so we've got. Yeah, we that. If you want to post this stuff already. Um, this is a, just another one that says quadrature only, or it's a CP. But again, that's going to be all your transfer coils. Um, receive coil any tight. Oh, this one says only use 1.5 T4s all the flow for. So this is one where it says only 1.5. So not a one Tesla, not a three Tesla. And well, most, we all pretty much work in hydrogen imaging, which is a 64 megahertz range for 1.5. Um, different types, again, we don't really do. But there are some places that have different RF transmitters at different frequencies. So like one, I know they used to have one at OSU for research that was for phosphorus imaging. So here's a implant that talks about the uh, V1 routine squared. So again, less than two microtesla. So you mentioned it's very similar to how you do SAR, you're just looking at a different value. And but if you see the limitation, you can do 2.0 microtesla or 0.1 watts per kilogram. So this 0.1 is extremely restrictive. Pretty much the only scan you're be able to do is like maybe a 3D21 gradient, and you might be able to do um, a couple slices, like say, 
do a TR of 15,000 and do like four or five slices of a T2. And that's gonna take like two or three minutes. So it's gonna take you like 20 minutes to do a T2 on a brain with that. Whereas if you do it at two micro Tesla, you barely have to make any changes to your protocol more than likely. So you can run your standard protocol. So this is why if you have the option for me with plus RMS, because again, it's not making any assumptions. It's a direct measure of the RF um, from the scanner, from the parameters you've selected. Whereas SAR is a, a estimate based on height and weight from the manufacturer, and every manufacturer is a little bit different based on their algorithms. So that's why you always want to use Beyond Plus or MS if it's not option. So this is one that says maximum slew rate of 200 mil Tesla per meter per second or less. Again, you don't really have control over this. So I don't really, I have from, you know, again at OSU, when they see this, I basically have told them to ignore it for the most part, unless they see a very restrictive value. This is most scanners are, the maximum they go is that. So most scanners fall in that criteria anyway, but there's not really a way as a tech for you to control that. Um, so here's also an example of an RF map. So just so you can understand that. So this is a logarithmic scale. So this is if you have, say, an isocenter, you have 100% of the RF power. Once you go out to, this is about 25 centimeters roughly. We're down to, I believe this is about, this is 10%. So we're down to about 13%. So if you're at the edge of your field of view, the RF exposure is gonna be significantly less than it is gonna be at the center. Now remember, it's average when you're reading SAR and values. So really, the it's not gonna be 13%. It's gonna be a little bit more than probably 13%, but it's gonna be significantly less. So if the implant's at the edge of the field of view versus the center, there's gonna be much less concern for you. So this may also change how you position people for certain implants or things. But again, your safety officer will uh, more than likely be able to direct you better on those. We go back to the um, spatial gradient map up here. So we can look at that real quick. So on the spatial gradient maps, so right here, this is done in Gauss per centimeter, but you can do conversions. Um, I believe, yeah. So 720 Gauss per centimeter is 7200 millitesla per meter or 7.2 tesla per meter. So if you look, the highest spatial on the scanner is like really out. So this is the bore right here. And when I, I made four quadrants of it, so it's easier to understand. So you can see this is that one quadrant, and I just flipped it around. So this is your actual MR bore in the center. This is like, say, the front of your scanner, that's the back of your scanner. And you have this 15 uh, tesla per meter is right here, right next to the scanner. So unless someone's like given scanner chest bumps or something, they're probably not gonna get experience that high of a spatial gradient. Um, if they're laying on the table and the object is in the center, they're probably gonna pass through this area right here, which if you look, the highest we get is about three, between three and five tesla per meter, so that's three to 500 gauss per centimeter. Um, so that's about the highest value you probably would experience in the center. If the patient, you know, you're a little off to the side, like either anterior or posterior, then it might get upwards of say five to seven hundred range, probably right in here. Uh, it's hard to say exactly because you kind of this is ten, that's five, so seven is probably right, right there. But taking that into consideration, that you know how the patient's going to the scanner can also affect what area, what they're being exposed to. But when you see listed maximum spatial gradient, that's generally going to be under the cover of the magnet where the patient can't even reach and off to the side, like right here. So if um, you don't have spatial gradient maps and all you see is the MSG reported for your system, the actual spatial gradient the patient will be exposed to is significantly less. And then when you take the consideration again that your daily activities are gonna experience more than the force of gravity, which is where those measurements are made for at equal to or less than, when you take that into consideration, that's why I say, you know, this is not generally something as a strict contraindication, but it's, Follow it, but if you can't, you know, warrants discussion before you proceed with the radiologist. Any other questions about anything specifically? I know it's a lot of information. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what do you guys normally do for things that are not tested? Because I think everyone in our department kind of has a different opinion on that. So if it's not tested, depending on the status, how emergent the study is. So if you have something that one, if you depends on if you don't know what it is, mm -hmm. or if you know what it is, but there's just no testing on it. Um, usually that's when you contact MRSO 
MRSO will then do an evaluation, usually either tell you from there. So sometimes like what I do personally is, if it's something simple, I'll just explain to the tech, tell the radiologist this, have them call me if he has any questions. And I'll say, I think it's low risk or I think it's high risk. Like I'll give them an, ass an assessment. If I think it's a bit more complicated, then I'll usually speak with the radiologist directly and explain to them the, the situation. Um, sometimes if we can't really figure it out at that time or we feel like we need more information, we may cancel them or reschedule the patient. Um, it's really just kind of between the, really it's up to the radiologist and between the MRSO kind of how they want to proceed there. But um, if we see these occur though, like something that happens, um, what we I've done is then we have a our safety committee, MR safety committee that meets, will then bring up issues like this that come up and implants that we see. And if there isn't any testing available, then we may look at, we'll evaluate the device and deter, try to do our best determination of what we want to do as a standard practice so we can be more standard across the board, get approval from the medical director, and then we have a document that lists approved devices. So we basically have a thing that says, you know, if you have this device, you can scan it with these guidelines. We also do that for certain guide things where we run into severe restrictions that we feel are inappropriate. So I've got some of those before where that the restrictions seem really, really restrictive and there's no reason for it, that we've gotten approval through, again, the safety committee and the medical director, that we can go off of, away from what the actual guidelines say. Then, then, but again, it's in, a document that's in basically guidelines and policy that says this is what we do instead. So with our safety committee, um, we're working on, I have a list of now five things that we have like done resources benefits. It hasn't went out on our main website yet just because I'm also talking with the medical director at Grant. But if there's things like that that you, if there's implants like that you have concerns on, bring them to me because then I have either a personal conversation with Dr. Bussey and Dr. Hauser or via email and then they actually write what, you know, the conditions and everything like that. So, and I actually just heard back from Dr. Hauser last week, so it's nothing has been, we just haven't gotten an appropriate form. And something else that we're doing now, and I think they were going to start doing similar here, is they have, we have, um, I actually have MRSO like assessment notes for in EPIC that when I make an assessment of something, that if it's low, high risk, how I made my assessment, what my justification was for it, actually goes into progress now. So that's something that is also useful. So that way it's, and the reason I, I have it labeled in there so they, people can find those, they can search for them. So when the patient comes back, it says like what study they were for, what, uh, what the assessment was for that study, you know, if, you know, it's going to be applicable to all studies or not, I may make a note for that. So, like, if it's going to be applicable to every study, because it doesn't matter, then I'll put a note in there and say, you know, it's for any study. But if it's for a specific study, I'll say, you know, for this study, this was the assessment. That way, if they come back, it's saving time, because while it's still technically you need to do a risk-benefit assessment, that doesn't say, oh, just proceed, because it's only assessing risks, not benefits of the study. You go to a radiologist, you say, here was the assessment. You know, how do we want to proceed? They say, do this and you go okay you just proceed so it gives recommendations and how to proceed and then basically the rad just kind of has to give his nod to say yeah do that so it makes it a little, little, little quicker that way in the future any other questions okay thank you